Welcome, everybody. Episode 2 of Queen Mu, the Egyptian Sphinx. Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches. Thanks for being here as always. We're going to jump right into the material. Introduction. Origin of the name Mayak. The country known today as Yucatan, one of the states of the Mexican Confederacy, may indeed be justly regarded by the ethnologists, the geologists, the naturalist, the philologist, the archaeologist, and the historian as a most interesting field of study. Its area of 73,000 square miles, covered with dense forests, is literally strewn with the ruins of numerous antique cities, majestic temples, stately palaces, the work of the learned architects, now heaps of debris, come crumbling under the inexorable tooth of time and the impious hand of the iconoclastic collectors of relics for museums. Among these, the statues of priests and kings, mutilated and defaced by the action of the elements. The hand of time and that of man lie prostrate in the dust. Walls covered with bas relief, inscriptions and sculptures carved in marble, containing the panegyphs of rulers, the history of the nation, its cosmogonical traditions, the ancient religious rites, and observances of its people, inviting decipherment, attract the attention of the traveler. The geological formation of its stony soil, so full of curious deposits of fossil shells of the Jurassic period, its unexplored caves, supposed dwellings of spirits and elves, creatures of the fanciful and superstitious imagination of the natives, its subterraneous streams of cool and limpid water, inhabited by badgers and other fish, fish are yet to be studied by the modern geologist, while its flora and fauna so rich and so diversified, but imperfectly known, await classification at the hand of the naturalist. The peculiar, though, a lot of vernacular of the natives, preserved through the lapse of ages, despite the invasions of barbaric tribes, the persecution by Christian conquerors, ignorant, avarice, and bloodthirsty, or fanatical monks who believed they pleased the Almighty by destroying a civilization equal, if not superior, to theirs, is full of interest for the philologist and the ethnologist. Situated between 18 degrees and 21 degrees of latitude north and 86 degrees and 90 degrees of longitude west of Greenwich Meridian, Yucatan forms the peninsula that divides the Mexican Gulf from the Caribbean Sea. Bishop Londa informs us that when, at the beginning of the year 1517, Francisco Hernandez de Cordova, the first of the Spaniards who set foot in the country of the Mayas, landed on a small island, which he called Mugaris. The inhabitants, on being asked the name of the country, answered, Ulumil, eh, the land of the deer, and Ulumil Cuts, the land of the turkey. Until then, the Europeans were ignorant of the existence of such a place. For although Juan Diaz Solas and Vincent Jans Pannons came in sight of its eastern coasts in 1506, they did not land nor make known their discovery. Herrera, in his De Cadas, tells us that when Columbus, in his fourth voyage to America, was at anchor near the island of Pinos in the year 1502, his ships were boarded by Maya navigators. These came from the west, from the country known to its inhabitants under the general name of the Great Khan, Serpent, and the Cateo, Cateo, Cucumber Tree. The peninsula, then divided into many districts or provinces, each governed by an independent ruler, who had given a peculiar title to his own dominions, seems 
to have had no general name. One district was called Shikan, another Sepek, another Chowaka, another Mayapan, and so on. Mayapan, however, was a very large district whose king was regarded as suzerain by other chieftains. Previous to the destruction of his capital by the people, headed by the nobility, they having become tired of his exations and pride. This rebellion is said to have taken place 71 years before the advent of the Spanish adventures in the country. The powerful dynasty of the Cocombs, which had held tyrannical sway over the land for more than two centuries, then came to an end. Among the chroniclers and historians, several have ventured to give an etymology of the word Maya. None, however, seem to have known its true origin. The reason is very simple. At the time of the invasion of the country by the turbulent and barbaric Nahuatls, the books containing the record of the ancient traditions of the history of the past ages from the settlement of the peninsula by its primitive inhabitants had been carefully hidden by the learned philosophers and the wise priests who had charge of the libraries and the temples and the colleges in order to save the precious volumes from the hands of the barbarous tribes from the west. These entering the country from the south came spreading ruin and desolation. They destroyed the principal cities, the images of the heroes, of the great men, of the celebrated women that adorned the public squares and edifices. This invasion took place in the year 522, or thereabout, of the Christian era, according to the opinion of modern computers. As a natural consequence of the destruction by the invaders of Chichen Itza, then the seat of learning, the Itzes, preferring ostracism to submitting to their vandal-like conquerors, abandoned their homes and colleges and became wanderers in the desert. Then the arts and sciences soon declined. With their degeneracy came that of civilization. Civil war, that inevitable consequence of invasions, political strife, and religious dissension, broke out before long and caused the dismemberment of the kingdom. It culminated in the sack and burning of the city of Mayapan and the extinction of the royal family of the Kokoms in 1420 AD, 270 years after its foundation. In the midst of the social cataclysms that gave the coup de grace to the Maya civilization, the old traditions and lore were forgotten or became disfigured engrafted with the traditions, superstitions, and fables of the Nahuatls, they assumed the shape of myths. The great men and women of the primitive ages were transformed into the gods of the elements and of the phenomena of nature. The ancient libraries having disappeared, new books had to be written. They contained those myths. The Troano and Dresden MSS seemed to belong to that epoch. They contained, besides some of the old cosmogonical traditions, the tenets and precepts of the new religion that sprang from the blending of the ceremonies of the antique form of worship of the Maya with the superstitious notions, the sanguine rites, and the obscene practices of the phallic cult of the Nahuatls, the laws of the land, and the vestiges of science and knowledge of the philosophers of past ages that still lingered among some of the noble families, transmitted as heirlooms by word of mouth from father to son. These books were written in new alphabetical letters, and some of the ancient demotic or popular characters that, being known to many of the noble families, remained in usage. With the old orders of priesthood and the students, the knowledge of the heretic or sacred mode of writing had disappeared. The legends graven on the facades of the temples and palaces being written in those characters were no longer understood, except perhaps by a few archaeologists who were sworn to secrecy. The names of the builders, their history, that of the phenomena of nature they had witnessed, the tenets of the religion they had professed, all contained 
as we have said, in the inscriptions that cover these antique walls, were as much a mystery to the people as to the multitudes which have since contemplated them with amazement during centuries to the present day. Bishop Londa, speaking of the edifices at Izumal, asserts that the ancient buildings of the Mayas at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards in the Yucatan were already heaps of ruins, objects of awe and veneration to the aborigines who lived in their neighborhood. They had lost, he says, the memory of those who built them and of the object for which they had been erected. Yet before their eyes were their facades covered with sculptures, inscriptions, figures of human beings and animals, in the round and in the bas reliefs, in a better state of preservation than they are now, not having then suffered so much injury at the hand of man, for the natives regarded them as their descendants do still, with reverential fear. There were recorded the legends of the past, a dead letter for them, as for the learned men of the present age. There also, on the interior walls of many apartments, were painted in bright colors, pictures that would grace the parlors of our mansions, representing the events in the history of certain personages who had flourished at the dawn of the life of their nation. Scenes that had been enacted in former ages were portrayed in very beautiful bas-reliefs. But these, speaking tablets, were, for the majority of the people, as much enigmas as they are today. Still travelers and scientists are not wanting to pretend that these strange buildings were constructed by the same race now inhabiting the peninsula, or by their near ancestors. Regardless of Cataludo's assertion that is is not known who their builders were, and that the Indians themselves preserved no traditions on the subject, Unmindful, likewise, of these words of Lazana, that when the Spaniards came to this country, notwithstanding that of some of the moments, appeared new, as if they had been built only twenty years. The Indians did not live in them, but used them as temples and sanctuaries, offering in them sacrifices, sometimes of men, women, and children, and that their construction dated back to a very high antiquity. The historiographer par excellence of Yucatan, Cagaludo, informs us that in his stay, the middle of the 17th century, scarcely a little more than 100 years after the conquest, the memory of these adulterated traditions was already fading from the mind of the Aborigines. Of the people who first settled in this kingdom of Yucatan, he says, nor of their ancient history, have I been able to find any more data than those I mention here. The books and other writings of the chroniclers and historians from the Spanish conquest to our times should therefore be considered well nigh valueless so far as the history of primitive inhabitants of the country, the events that transpired in remote ages, and ancient traditions in general are concerned. Seeing that Cagaludo says they were unable to procure any information on the subject. It seems to me that it is time, he says, to speak of the various things pertaining to this country and of its natives. Not, however, with the extensions some might desire, mentioning in detail their origin and the countries whence they may have come. For it would be difficult for me to ascertain now that which so many learned men were unable to find out at the beginning of the conquest even inquiring with great diligence, as they affirm, particularly since there exist no longer any papers or traditions among the Indians concerning the first settlers from whom they are descended. Our evangelical ministers who imported the faith in order to radically extirpate idolatry, having burned all the characters and paintings they could get a hold of in which were written their histories, and that in order to take from them all remembrances of their ancient rites. Those who undertook to write the narrative of the conquest and the history of the country in order to procure the necessary data for this had naturally to interrogate the natives. These were either unable or unwilling to impart the knowledge sought. It may be that some of those whom inquiries were made were descendants of the Nahutals, ignorant of the ancient history of the Mayas, 
Others may have been some of the Mexican mercenaries who dwelled on the coast, where they were barely tolerated by the other inhabitants because of their sanguinary practices. They, from the first, had welcomed the Spaniards as friends and allies, had maintained with them intimate relations during several years before the invaders ventured into the interior of the country, fearing that if they had pleaded ignorant of the history, it might be ascribed to unwillingness on their part to answer the questions. Dreading also to alienate the goodwill of the men with long grounds, who defended them against the others that handled the thunderbolts. Those strangers covered with iron, now masters of the country and of their persons, who on the slightest provocation subjected them to such terrible punishments and atrocious torments. They recited the nursery tales with which their mothers had lulled them to sleep in the days of their childhood. These stories were set down as undoubtful traditions of olden times. Later on, when the conquest was achieved, some of the natives who really possessed a knowledge of the myths, traditions, and facts of history contained in the books that those same men with long gowns had willfully destroyed by feeding the flames with them, notwithstanding their earnest protestations of the owners, invented plausible tales when questioned and narrated these as facts, unwilling as they were, to tell the truth to foreigners who had come to their country uninvited, arms in hand, carrying war and desolation wherever they went, slaughtering men, outraging the wives and the virgins, destroying their homes, their farms, their cities, spreading ruin and devastation throughout the land, desecrating the temples of their gods, trampling underfoot the sacred images, the venerated symbols of the religion of their forefathers, imposing upon them strange idols, that they said were likenesses of the only true God of his mother, an assertion that seemed most absurd to those worshippers of the sun, moon, and other celestial bodies, who regarded Q, Ku, the divine essence, the uncreated soul of the world, as the only supreme God, not to be represented under any shape. Yet by lashes, torture, death even, the victims were compelled to pay homage to these images, with rites and ceremonies, the purport of which they were, as their descendants still are, unable to understand. Being at the same time forbidden to observe the religious practices which they had been accustomed to from times immemorial. More, their temples of learning were destroyed. With their libraries and the precious volumes that contain the history of their nation, that of their illustrious men and women whose memory they venerated, the sciences of their wise men and philosophers, how then could it be expected that they should tell what they knew of the history of their people and treat as friends men whom they hated and with reason from their heart of hearts, men who held their gods in contempt, men who had, without provocation, destroyed the autonomy of their nation, broken up their families, reduced their kin to slavery, brought misery upon them, gloom and mourning throughout the land. Now that 355 years have elapsed since their country became part of the domain of the Spanish crown, one might think, and not a few do try to persuade themselves otherwise, that old feuds, rancor, and distrust must be forgotten. In fact, must be replaced by friendship, confidence, gratitude, even for all the blessings received at the hands of the Spaniards, not the least among these, the destruction of their idolatrous rites, the knowledge of the true God, and the mode of worshipping he likes best, notwithstanding the unfair means used by their good friends, those of the long gowns, to force such blessings and the knowledge upon them, and cause them to forget and forgo the customs and manners of their forefathers. Today, when the Aborigines are said to be free citizens of the Republic of Mexico, entitled to all the rights and privileges that the Constitution is supposed to confer on all men born within the boundaries of the country, they yet seek, and with good cause, the seclusion of the recesses of the densest forest far away from the haunts of their white fellow citizens to perform in secrecy. Certain ancient rites and religious practices that even now linger among them, 
to which they adhere with great tenacity, and that the persecution and ill treatment they have endured have been powerless to extirpate. Yes, indeed, up to the present time they keep whatever knowledge of their traditions they may still possess carefully concealed in their bosoms. Their lips are hermetically sealed on the subject. Their confidence in, their respect and friendship for, one not of their blood and race, must be very great. For them to allow him to witness their ceremonies, or become acquainted with the import of certain practices, or be told the meaning of peculiar signs and symbols, transmitted to them orally by their fathers. This reserve may be the reason why some travelers, unable to obtain any information from the aborigines, have erroneously asserted that they have lost all traditionary lore, that all tradition has certainly disappeared from among them. Maya was the name of a powerful nation that in remote ages dwelt in the peninsula of Yucatan and the countries today called Central America, comprised between the Isthmus of Tehuantepec on the north and that of the Darien on the south. That name was as well known among the ancient civilized nations the world over as at present as the names of Spain, France, England, etc. As for these countries, as for these country colonists abandoning the land of their birth, have gone and still go forth in search of new homes in far distant regions, have carried and do carry with the customs, manners, religion, civilization, and language of their forefathers, the name even of the mother country to their new abodes. So we may imagine it happened with the Mayas at some point period in the past, for it is a fact that whenever we find their name, there also we meet with the vestiges of their languages, customs, and many of their traditions. But nowhere except in the Yucatan is the origin of their name to be found. Among the various authors who have written on the country, several have endeavored to give the etymology of the word Maya. None has succeeded. For instead of consulting the Maya books that escaped destruction at the hands of the Zumargas, Landas, and Torquemadas, they have appealed to their imagination, as if in their fancy they could find the motives that promoted the primitive inhabitant to apply such or such name to this or that locality. Ramon D. Ordonez Riega fancied that the name Maya was given to the peninsula on account of the scarcity of water on its surface, and intimated that it is derived from the two vocables ma, meaning no, and ha, meaning water, without water. Razier, following his own pet ideas, combats such explanation as incorrect and says, The country is far from being devoid of water. Its soil is honeycombed and innumerable caves exist just under the surface. In these caves are deposits of cool, limpid water, extensive lakes fed by subterranean streams. Hence, he argues that the true etymology of the word Maya may possibly be the mother of the waters, or the teats of the waters, ma i a, she of the four hundred breasts, as they were wont to represent the Ephesian goddess. Again, this explanation did not suit Signor Encona, for he ridicules the etymologists. What nonsense, he says, to thus rack their brains. They must be out of their mind to give themselves the work of bringing forth these erudite eludiations to explain the word Maya, that everybody knows is a mere Spanish corruption of Mayab, the ancient name of the country, and asserting that the true name of the peninsula in ancient times was Mayab, Signor Encona does not sustain from assertion by any known historical document. He merely refers to the Maya dictionary of Pio Perez that he himself had published. He is likewise silent as to the source from which Signor Pio Perez obtained his information concerning the ancient name of the peninsula. Londa, Tagoludu, Bianza, all accord in stating that the land was called U Lumil Se, the land of the deer. Herrera says it was called Beb, a very thorny tree, and the great serpent, Khan, but we see in the Troano MS that this was the name of the whole of the Maya Empire, 
not the peninsula alone. Senior Ancona, notwithstanding his sneers, is not quite sure of being right in his criticism, for he also tries his hand at etymology, etymologizing, taking for granted that the statement of Lazana is true, that at some time or other, two different tribes had invaded the country, and that one of these tribes was more numerous than the other. He pretends that the word Mayab was meant to designate the weaker, being composed, he says, of Ma, Not, and Yab, Abundant. I myself, on the strength of the name given to the birthplace of their ancestors by the Egyptians, and on that of the tradition handed down among the aborigines of the Yucatan, admitting that one of the names given to the peninsula, Mayab, was correct, considering, moreover, the geological formation of its soil, its porousness, remembering, besides, that the meaning of the word Mayab is a sieve, a tammy, I wrote, It is very difficult, without the help of the books, of the learned priests of the Mayab, to know positively why they gave that name to their country. I can only surmise that they called it so far the great absorbent quality of its stony soil, which is an incredibly short time absorbs the water at the surface. This water, percolating through the pores of the stone, is afterward found filtered, clear, and cool in the cenotes and caves where it forms vast deposits. When I published the foregoing lines in 1881, I had not studied the contents of the Troano MS. I was therefore entirely ignorant of its historical value. The discovery of a fragment of mural painting in the month of February 1882 on the walls of an apartment in one of the edifices at Kaba caused me to devote many months to study of the Maya text of that interesting old document. It was with considerable surprise that I then discovered that several pages at the beginning of the second part are dedicated to the reticle of the awful phenomenon that took place during the cataclysm that caused the submersion of ten countries, among which the land of Mu, that large island probably called Atlantis by Plato, and the formation of the strangely crooked line of islands known to us as West Indies, but as the land of the scorpion to the Mayas, I was no less astonished than gratified to find an account of the events in the life of the personages whose portraits, busts, and statues I had discovered among the ruins of the edifices raised by them at Chichen and Uxmal, whose history, portrayed in the mural paintings, is also recounted in the legends and the sculptures still adorning the walls of their palaces and temples. And to learn that these ancient personages had already been converted at the time the author of the Toronto MS wrote his book into the gods of the elements and made the ancients who produced the terrible earthquakes that shook parts of the lands of the West to their very foundations as told in the narrative of the Akab Sib and finally caused them to be engulfed by the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. The author of the Troano MS gives in his work the adjoining map of the land of Beb, the land of the mulberry tree, and the Maya Empire. In it, he indicates the localities which were submerged, and those that still remained above water in that part of the world after the cataclysm. In the legend, explanatory of his object in drawing that chart, as in many other places in his book, he gives the serpent head, Khan, south, as symbol of the southern continent. He represents the northern by this monogram that reads Ak, turtle. By this sign, placed between the two others, he intends to convey to the mind of his readers that the submerged places to which he refers are situated between the two western continents, are bathed by the waters of the Mexican Gulf, and are more particularly by those of the Caribbean Sea, figured by the image of an animal resembling a deer placed over the legend. It is well to remark that this animal is typical of the submerged Antillean valleys, as it will plainly appear. 
further on. The lines lightly etched here are painted blue in the original, as in our topographical maps. The edges of the watercourses of the seas and lakes are painted blue. So the Maya hierogrammatist figured the shores of the Mexican Gulf, indicated by the serpent head, the three signs of locality placed in the center of said gulf, mark the site of the extinguished volcano known today as Alacran's Reef. The serpent head was, for the Maya writers, typical of the sea, whose billows they compared to the undulations of a serpent in motion. They therefore called the ocean Kana, a word whose radical is Khan, serpent, the meaning of which is the mighty serpent. The lines of the drawing more strongly etched, the end of which corresponds to the sign, are painted red. The color of clay, concob, and indicate the localities that were submerged and turned into marshes. This complex sign is formed of the emblem of countries near or in the water and of the cross made of dotted lines, symbol of the cracks and crevices made on the surface of the earth by the escaping gases represented by the dots and of small circles, images of volcanoes. As to the character, it is composed of two letters, equivalent to Maya and the Greek letter A, so entwined as to form the character equal to the Greek and Maya K, but forming a monogram that reads Ak, the Maya word for turtle. Before proceeding with the etymology of the name Mayak, it may not be amiss to explain the legends and the other drawings of the table. It will be noticed that the characters over that part of the drawing, which look like the horizontal branch of a tree, are identical with those placed vertically against the trunk, but in an inverted position. It is in fact the same legend repeated, and so written for the letter understanding of the map and of the exact position of the various localities, that of the Mexican Gulf figured on the left, and of the ideographic or pictorial representation of the Caribbean Sea to the right of the table. In order to thoroughly comprehend the idea of the Maya author, it is indispensable to have a perfect knowledge of the contours of the sea and lands mentioned by him in this instance, even as they exist today. Of course, some slight changes since the epoch referred to by him have naturally taken place, and the outlines of the shores are somewhat altered, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, as can be ascertained by consulting maps made by the Spaniards at the time of the conquest. The adjoining map of Central America, the Antilles, and the Gulf of Mexico, being copied from that published by the Bureau of Hydro Hydrography at Washington, may be regarded as accurate. On it, I have traced in dotted lines figures that will enable anyone to easily understand why the Maya author symbolized the Caribbean Sea as a deer and the empire of Mayak as a tree rooted in the southern continent and having a single branch, horizontal, and pointing to the right, that is, in an easterly direction. A glance at the map of the drowned valleys of the Antilly lands, published by Professor J.W. Spencer of Washington in the Bulletin of Geographical Society of America for January 1895, which is reproduced here with the author's permission, must convince anyone that the ancient Mayan geologists and geographers were not far behind their brother professors in these sciences of modern times. In their knowledge, at least, of those parts of the earth they inhabited, and of the adjoining countries. The sign that most attracts the attention is that Bishop Londa says must be read Yaxkin, and was that of the seventh month of the Maya calendar. Literally, these words mean the vigorous sun. If, however, we interpret the symbol phonetically, it gives us the country of the king, which is surrounded by water the kingdom in the midst of the water. It will also be noticed that in its place at the top of the tree to indicate that the tree is the kingdom. Next to it on the left is the name Mayak, which indicates that it is the kingdom 
of Mayak, which will become plain by analysis of symbols to begin with a wing or a feather insignia worn by kings and warriors. Placed here, it has a double meaning. It denotes the north, as we will see later on, and also shows that the land is that of the king whose emblem it is. The character stands for Aawa, the word for king. And we have already seen that this Lumil is the symbol for land near or in or surrounded by water. As the empire of Mayak, the peninsula of the Yucatan and Central America, are certainly surrounded by water. On the north, by the Gulf of Mexico, on the east, by the Caribbean Sea, and on the west and south, by the Pacific Ocean. The symbol then reads Lumil Awa, the king's country, the kingdom. But how do you make your rendering accord with the meaning given to the character by Bishop Londa? I fancy I hear our learned Americanists asking, and I answer, in a very simple manner knowing, as I do, the genius of the Maya people and their language. The ancient armorial of the country still exists on the western facade of the sanctuary at Uxmal, and in the bas reliefs carved on the memorial monument of Prince Ko at Chichen. The emblem represents, on said echelon, scarcely needs explanation. It is easily read, U Lumilkin, the land of the sun. The kings of the Mayak, like those of Egypt, Chaldea, India, China, Peru, etc., took upon themselves the title of children of the sun, and in a boasting spirit, that of the strong, the vigorous sun. Kin is the Maya word for sun, but kin is also the title of the highest priest of the sun. As in Egypt and many other civilized countries, so in Mayak, the king was, at the same time, chief of the state and of the religion, as in our times the queen in England, the Tsar in Russia, the Sultan in Turkey, etc. The title Yaxkin may therefore be applied among the Mayas to the king and to the kingdom, and my rendering of the symbol does not conflict with that of Landa. In the tablet, the Mayan empire is portrayed by the beb, a tree with the trunk full of thorns. The trunk is the image of the chain of mountains that traverse the whole country from north to south. There dwelt the masters of the earth, the volcanoes. They gave it life, power, strength. This chain is, as it were, its backbone. It terminates at the isthmus of Darien to the south. This is why the tree is planted in the character Khan that Londa tells us was the name for South anciently. At the north, the branch of the tree extends eastward, that is, to the right of the trunk. This branch, the peninsula of the Yucatan, is represented by this symbol, which, with but a slight difference in the drawing, is the same as that placed in the vertical legend in an inverted position against the trunk of the tree, by which the author has designated the whole country, calling it yu ma Yak, the land of the shoot, the land of the veritrum, from the name of the peninsula that seems to have been the seat of the government of the Maya Empire. The motive for the slight change in the drawing is easily explained. The peninsula jutting out into the sea from the mainland as a shoot, a branch from the trunk of the tree, is indicated by the representation of Yak, a veritrum, the base of which rests on the sign of land, Ma, or also of a shoot projecting beyond two imix symbols of the two basins of water, that is, of the Mexican Gulf and the Caribbean Sea, that are on each side of it. The whole hieroglyph Name of the peninsula reads, therefore, Yumayak, the place of the ancestors' veritrum, or of the shoot of the tree. These two imix differed somewhat in shape. The imix is meant to designate the Caribbean Sea, 
the eastern part of which, being open to the waves of the ocean, is indicated by the wavy line emblem of water. In this instance, it may also denote the mountains in the islands that close it, as it were, toward the rising sun. The other Imex stands for the Gulf of Mexico, a Mediterranean sea, completely landlocked, with a small entrance formed by the peninsula of Florida and that of the Yucatan, and commanded by the island of Cuba. It is well to notice that, as has been already said, some of the signs in the horizontal legend are the same as those in the vertical legend, but placed in an inverse position with regard to one another. This is as it should be naturally. Of course, the particular names of the various localities in the country are somewhat different, and the signs indicating their position with reference to the cardinal points are not the same. The symbol Imex, for instance, of the Mexican Gulf is placed in the vertical legend to the left. That is to the west of the Imex image of the Caribbean Sea, as it should certainly be if we look at the map of Central America from the south, when it is apparent that the Gulf of Mexico lies to the westward of the Caribbean Sea. On the other hand, if we enter the country from the north, the Gulf of Mexico will be to the right and the Caribbean Sea to the left. Of the traveler, just as the Maya hierogrammist placed them in the horizontal legend. To return to the character in which the foot of the tree is planted, Khan not only means south, as we have just seen, but it has many other exceptions, all conveying the idea of might, power. It is a variation of Khan, serpent. The serpent with inflated breast, suggested by the contour of the Mayan Empire, was adopted as the symbol of the same. Its name became that of the dynasty of the Maya rulers and their totem. We see it sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces raised by them. In Mayak, in Egypt, in China, India, and Peru, and many other places, the image of the serpent was the badge of royalty. It formed part of the headdresses of the kings. It was embroidered on their royal garments. Khan is still the title of the kings of Tartary, Burma, etc. That of the governors of provinces in Afghanistan, Persia, and other countries in Central Asia. That the tree was almost meant by the author of the Toronto MS as symbol of the Mayan Empire, there can be no doubt. He himself takes the pains to inform us of the fact Beb Uwakal, the Beb has sprung up between Uk Lumilab, the seven countries of Khan. The sign is painted red in the original to indicate the arable land, Kankab, was the symbol of land, country among the Mayas, as with the Egyptians. But the former used it also as a numerical for five to which, in this case, must be added to two units. So we have seven fertile lands. The four black dots are the numerical four and another ideographic sign of the name of the country, Khan, serpent. This is why it is placed at the foot of the tree, like the sign at the top to signify that it is the kingdom. They are juxtaposed to the character Khan, also to note its geographical position. It will be noticed that this sign was omitted in the horizontal legend, as it should be, since Khan is the word for south, but it has been replaced by Ix, north, which sign has been incorporated with the sign Beb, thus to show that this is the northern part of the tree, that is, of the country. There remains to be explained what may be considered, in the present instance, the most important character of the table, since it is the original name given in the most remote ages to that part of the Maya Empire known on our maps as the peninsula of the Yucatan. It reads, Mayak, the land just sprung, the primitive land, the hard land, the symbol itself is an ideographic representation of the peninsula and its surroundings, as will be shown. 
The reason that caused it to be adopted by learned men of Mayak as the symbol for the name of their country is indeed most interesting. It clearly explains its etymology and also gives us a knowledge of the scope of their scientific attainments. Among these, their perfect understanding of the forces that produced the submersion of many lands and the upheaval of the peninsula and other places. A thorough acquaintance with the geography of the continent wherein they dwelt, and of the lands adjacent in the ocean, that even of the ill-fated island mentioned by Plato, its destruction by earthquakes, and the sad doom of its inhabitants that remained, a historical fact preserved in the annals treasured in the Egyptian temples, as well as in those of the Mayas. May we not assume that the identity of traditions indicates that at some epoch, more or less remote, intimate relations and communications must have existed between the inhabitants of the valley of the Nile and the peoples dwelling in the lands of the West. We shall begin the interpretation of the symbol with the analysis of the character that Londa tells us stood among the Mayan writers either for Ma, Mi, or Mo. Some would be critics among the Americanists or contemporaries have accused the bishop of ignorance regarding the writing system of the Mayas, or of incompetency in, in transmitting to us the true value of this character, simply because he gave it a plurality, or what seems to be a plurality of meanings. What right, it may be asked, have we to dispute the fact asserted by Bishop Londa? that in this time, among the Mayas, the character was equivalent to Ma, or perhaps to Mi, and Mo. Had he not better opportunity than any of us for knowing it? Did not the chiefs of the Franciscan order in Yucatan consider it a prime duty to become thoroughly versed and have all their missionaries instructed in the language of the natives, to whom they had to preach the gospel, and after converting them to Christianity, to administer the sacraments? Of their church? Were they not scholars, men conversant with grammatical studies? Who but they have reduced to grammatical rules the Maya language for the benefit of students? Are we not told that Bishop Londa acquired a great proficiency in this? Was he not for many years a teacher of it? Has he not composed a grammar of that tongue for the use of his pupils? What right, then, have men in our age, innocent of all knowledge of Maya language, even as spoken today, however great may be their attainments in any other branch of learning, to pass judgment on, worse still, to condemn, a learned teacher of the language, charging him with ignorance and incompetency, simply because he assigns various meanings to a character? Perhaps Mr. Champollion. Le Jeune will be braided in like manner, because he tells us that the Egyptians represented indifferently the vowels A, E, I, O, U by the character. We see effectively, says the learned discoverer of the Egyptian alphabet, the leaf or feather as their homophones to mean, according to the occasion, an A, an I, an E, and even an O as the Aleph of the Hebrews. So do we find in the Egyptian tongue, written with Coptic letters, a dialect that uses indifferently A for O, where the others two write O only, and E where the other two write an A. We have in the same dialect Abi and Obi, Satire, and Reed and Rush, Junkus. Let us resume our explanation. We have found that in remote times, ma was the meaning of the character. Let us try to analyze its component parts and its relation to the name Mayak and its original and its origin as an alphabetic character. It is easy to see that it is composed of the geometrical figure flanked on each side by the symbol Imix. Who can fail to see that this figure bears a striking resemblance to the Egyptian sign that Dr. Young translates Ma, and Mr. 
Champollion asserts to be simply the letter M. By a strange coincidence, if coincidence there be, the meaning of the syllable Ma is the same in Maya and Egyptian. That is, in both languages, it signifies earth, place. The word place and site, says Champollion, of the Greek text of the Rosetta inscription is expressed in the hieroglyphic part of the tablet by an owl, or M, and the extended arm for A, which gives the Coptic word ma, site, place. We see that in the Tor Toronto MS, the author represented the earth by the figure of an old man, the grandfather, Mam, hence ma, earth, site, country, place. Ma in the Maya is also a particle used as in the Greek language in affirmation or negotiation according to its position before or after the verb. Another curious coincidence worthy of notice is that the sign of negation is absolutely the same for the Mayas as for the Egyptians. Bunsen says that the latter called it nin, the word in Maya means mirror, and Ninha, the mirror of water, was anciently one of the names of the Mexican Gulf. This also may be a coincidence. No one has ever told us why the learned hierogrammatists of Egypt gave to the sign the value of Ma. No one can, because nobody knows the origin of the Egyptians, of their civilization, nor the country where it grew from infancy to maturity. They themselves, although they invariably pointed towards the setting sun when questioned concerning the fatherland of their ancestors, were ignorant of whom they were and whence they came. Nor did they know who was the inventor of their alphabet. The Egyptians, who no doubt had forgotten or had never known the name of the inventor of their phonetic signs, at the time of Plato, honored with it one of their gods of the second order, Thoth, who likewise was held as the father of all sciences and arts. It is evident that when we can learn nothing from the Egyptians of the motives that promoted the inventor of their alphabetic characters to select that peculiar figure to represent the letter M, initial for their word Ma, the Mayas, we are informed, made use of the identical sign and ascribed to it the same signification. We may perhaps find out from one of them the reasons that induced their learned men to choose this strange geometrical figure as part of their symbol for Ma, radical of Mayak, the name of the peninsula of Yucatan. Who knows but that the same cause which promoted them to adopt and suggested is also to the mind of the Egyptian hierogrammatists. Many will, no doubt, object that this may be pure coincidence. The two peoples live so far apart. Very true. I do not pretend it is not accidental. I merely suggest a possibility that, added to other facts, may become a probability, if not a certainty. In the course of these pages, we shall meet with so many concurrent facts as having existed both in Mayak and Egypt, that it will become difficult to reconcile the mind to the belief that they are altogether the identical working of the human intelligence groping its way out of barbarism to civilization. As some have more than once hinted as a last resort in their inability to deny the striking concordance of these facts. We are told that in the origin of language, names were given to places, objects, tribes, individuals, or animals, in accordance with some peculiar inherent properties possessed by them, such as shape, voice, customs, etc., and to countries on account of their climate, geological formation, geographical configuration, or any other characteristic. That is, by onomatopoeia. This assertion seems to find confirmation in the symbol of the Mayas, and the name Mayak forms no exception to the rule. 
In fact, if we draw around the Yucatan Peninsula a geometrical figure enclosing it and composed of straight lines by following the direction of its eastern, northern, western coast, it is easy to see that the drawing so made will unavoidably be that symbol. That fact alone may not be deemed proof sufficient to affirm that the Mayas, in reality, did derive their sign for Ma from this cause, since to complete it, as transmitted by Londa, the character Amix is wanting on each side. It does not require a very great effort on the imagination to understand what this sign is meant for. A single glance will suffice to satisfy us that the drawing is intended to represent a woman's breast with its nipple and areola. Anyone inclined to doubt that such is the case will soon be convinced by examining the female figures portrayed in the Troano MS. Yes, Imix is the breast, the bosom, called today simply Im, the word having suffered the apoke of its descendants, Ix, which is a compulative conjunction in the sign of the feminine gender. But bosom is also an enclosed place. We say the bosom of the deep. It was in that sense, indeed, that the Maya sages, who invented the characters and symbols with which to give their thoughts a material form, made use of it. This fact becomes apparent if we examine the drawing still more closely and notice the four lines drawn in the lower part as if to shade it. If we consider each line, as equivalent to one unit, their sum represents the numerical four, Khan, in the Maya language. We have already seen that Khan also means serpent, one of the symbols of the sea, Kana. Then the two Imix are placed, one on each side of the geometrical figures, image of the peninsula, to typify the two gulfs whose waters bathe its shores. On the left, that of Mexico, on the right, that of the Caribbean. That this was the idea of the inventors of the symbol is evident. For as the Gulf of Mexico is smaller than the Caribbean Sea, and the western coastline of the Yucatan shorter than the eastern, so in the drawing, the Imex on the left of the figure is smaller than the Imex on the right, and the line of the left shorter than that on the right. This explanation being correct, it clearly proves as much as a proposition of that the nature can be demonstrated that the character owes its origins among the Mayas to the configuration of the Yucatan Peninsula and its position between two gulfs, and that the inventors were acquainted with their extent and contour. Not a few, even among well-read people, often express a doubt as to the ancient Mayas having possessed accurate information respecting the existence of the various continents and islands that form the habitable portions of the earth. Questioning likewise if they were acquainted even with the geography and configuration of the lands in which they lived, seeming to entertain the idea that the science of general geography belongs exclusively to modern times. The name Maya, found among all civilized nations of antiquity in Asia, Africa, Europe, as well as in America, always with the same meaning, should be sufficient to prove that in very remote ages, the Mayas had intimate relations with the inhabitants of the lands situated on those continents, were therefore great travelers, and must, perforce, have been acquainted with the general geography of the planet. We must not lose sight of the fact that we know but very little indeed of the ancient American civilizations. The annals of the learned men of Mayak having been either hidden or destroyed, it is impossible for us to judge of the scope of their scientific attainments. That they were expert architects, the monuments built by them, that have resisted for ages the disintegrating, disintegrating actions of the elements and that of vegetation, bear ample testimony. The analysis of the Naman, discovered by the writer in the ruins of the ancient city of Mayapan in 1880, proves conclusively that they had made advance in the science of astronomy. They knew, as well as we do, how to calculate the latitudes and longitudes, the epochs of the solstices and of the equinox, the division of time into solar years of 365 days and 6 hours, that of the year into 12 months of 30 days, to which they added 5 supplementary days 
that were left without name and regarded as inauspice. During these, as on the third day of the Epac among the Egyptians, all business was suspended. They did not even go out of their houses, lest some misfortune should befall them. All those calculations required, of course, a thorough knowledge of algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and the other branches of mathematics. That they were no mean draugsmen and sculptors, the fresco paintings, the inscriptions, and bas reliefs carved on marble that are still extant bear unimpeachable testimony. The study of the Toronto MS will convince anyone that the learned author of that book, and no doubt many of his associates, had not only a thorough knowledge of the geographical configuration of the Western continent and the adjacent islands, but also of their geological formation. The lands of the West are represented by these symbols, which have some have translated Atlan. They have no room for doubting that the Mayas were acquainted with the eastern coasts of said continent from the Bay of St. Lawrence in latitude north 48 degrees to Cape St. Roque in Brazil in latitude 5 degrees, 20 minutes. The two signs of the locality placed under the symbols represent the two large regions of the western continent, North and South America. While as the signs seen within the curve figuring the northern basin of the Atlantic stand for the land of Mu, that extensive island now submerged under the waves of the ocean. The sign, as well as this, that forms the upper part of the symbol, is familiar to all students of Egyptology. These will tell you that the first meant in the Egyptian hieroglyphs the sun setting on the horizon, and the second the mountainous countries in the west. As to the conventional posture given to all the statues of the rulers and other illustrious personages in Mayak, it confirms the fact of their geographical attainments. If we compare, for instance, the outlines of the effigy of Prince Ko discovered by the author at Chichen Itza in 1875, with the contour of the eastern coasts of the American continent, placing the head at Newfoundland, the knees at Cape St. Rogue, and the feet at Cape Horn, it is easy to perceive that they are identical. The shallow basin held on the belly of the statue between the hands would be the symbol of the Gulf of Mexico and of the Caribbean Sea. Again, the outlines of the profile of the statue may also represent with great accuracy the eastern shores of the Maya Empire, the head being the peninsula of Yucatan, anciently the seat of the government. The knees would then correspond to Cape Gracias a Dios in Nicaragua, the feet to the Isthmus of the Darien, the southern boundary of the empire, and the shallow basin on the belly would be, in that case, stand for the Bay of Honduras part of the Caribbean Sea. The Antilles were known to the Mayas as the land of the scorpion, Zinan, and were represented by the Maya hier hierogrammatists by the figure of that arachnid, arachnid, or in his cursive writing by this, proof evident that he was as well acquainted as we are with the general outlines of the archipelago. The ancient Maya sages sometimes liken the earth to a cauldron, come, because as nutrient is cooked in such utensils, so also all that exists on the surface of the earth is first elaborated in its bosom. Sometimes, likewise, on account of its rodentity, and because it contains the germs of all things, they compare the earth to a calabash, come seeds full of seeds these similes seem to have been favorite ones since they made frequent use of them in illustrating their explanations of the geological phenomena which have convulsed our planet perhaps also the second reason was what caused them to generally adopt a circular shape for the characters they invented to give material expression to the multitudinous conceptions of their mind 
The fact is that their symbol for the name Mayak of the peninsula of Yucatan affects the shape of a calabash with its tendrils just sprouted. A yak or ak, as to the natives call a young sprout. What can have induced their hierogrammatists to select a germinating calabash as part of the name of their country remains to be explained. If we examine the map of the lands back of the peninsula, it will not be difficult to discover the idea uppermost in the mind of the draftsman at the time of composing the symbol and to see that he was as thoroughly acquainted with the geography of the interior and the western shores of those parts of the continent as with the configuration of its eastern coasts. Also, that their geological formation was no mystery to him. By comparing this symbol with the shape of the countries immediately south of the peninsula, notwithstanding the changes that are continually taking place in the contour of the coastlines, particularly at the mouth of rivers, by the actions of currents, etc., we cannot fail to recognize that the hierogrammatists assumed it to be the sprout of Calabash, the body of which was represented by the lands comprised within the segment of a circle having for radius the half of a line parallel to the eastern and western shores of the peninsula. Starting from Point Lagartos on the northern coast of Yucatan, drawn across the country to the shore of the Pacific Ocean on the south, for if from the middle of said line as center we describe a circumference, part of it will follow exactly the bent of the coastline of said ocean. Opposite, the northern shore of the peninsula, another part will cross the isthmus of Tiwantipec, the northern frontier of the Maya Empire, and if carried overland on the south until it intersects the seaboard of the Bay of Honduras, the segment of the circle thus formed represents the bottom of a calabas, and the peninsula the sprout. Analyzing the character yet more closely, we see a line of dots on each side from the base of the sprout the root of which is made to repose on the curled figure intended to represent the curling of the smoke as it ascends into the air from the crater of volcanoes among the mountains, indicated, as on our maps, by the etchings on both sides of the body of the symbol. These tokens prove that the designer knew the geological formations of the country in which he had lived, and that the peninsula had been upheaved from the bottom of the sea by the action of volcanic forces whose center of activity was in his time, as it is still, in the mountains of Guatemala, far away in the interior of the continent. By placing the small end of the sprout deep into the figure on the focus of the volcanic action, on the circling, on the curling line of the smoke, and by the dots on both sides of the root of the sprout, he knows that he knew that the upheaval of the peninsula was affected by the expansive force of the gases which produce earthquakes by their pressure on the uneven undersurface of the superficial strata, too homogeneous to permit their escape. Thus it is that we come to learn from the pen of an ancient Maya philosopher that the name of his people, once upon a time, so broadly scattered over the face of, earth, of the earth, had its origins in that of the country they inhabited, a place situated in the northern tropical parts of the western continent, in that land of Kui, that mysterious home of their ancestors, where the Egyptians thought the souls of their departed friends went to dwell, which was known to its inhabitants as Mayak, a word that in their language meant the first land, the land just sprouted, also the hard land, the terra firma, as we learn from the sign of the aspiration and hardness, coagulation, placed each side of the body of the calabash to indicate, perhaps, the rocky formation of its soil and that it had withstood the awful cataclysms swept from the face of the earth, the land of Mu, and many other places with their populations. The priests of Egypt, Chaldea, and India preserved the remembrance of their destruction in the archives of their temples, as did those of Mayak on the other side of the ocean. The latter did not content themselves with recording the relation of their trespasses on geology and history, but in order to preserve its memory for future generations, they caused it to be carved on a stone tablet 
which they fastened to the wall in one of the apartments of their college at Chichen, where it is yet seen. The natives have perpetuated from generation to generation for centuries the name of the inscription. They still call it a kabsib, the awful and timbrious writing. The history of that terrible catastrophe, recounted in various ways in the sacred books of the different nations, among which vestiges of the presence of the Mayas are to be found, continues to be the appalling tradition of a great portion of mankind. End of introduction.